So um, this will be a whirlwind tour, and I apologize for its speed, but hopefully it will give you some glimpse about uh, what models are, why we build them, and, and when they get used. So th the challenges uh, that I like to use to motivate this with, with health science students are just noting that um, we as a society and as a globe are confronting ever more daunting health and health policy challenges. Um, uh, COVID-19 pandemic has revealed these in spades, um, including syndemics. We sometimes think of COVID-19 as one issue, but in fact, it's, it, it's involved in syndemically with many other issues, mental health distress, substance use and overdoses, for example, uh, here in Western Canada are at record levels because of interactions with the COVID-19 pandemic. We had two colliding epidemics, COVID-19 and, and opioid substance abuse and, and overdosing that have collided with disastrous consequences. Um, uh, we've been aware for much of the past century of, of, of the long shadows cast by adverse adversity early in life, adverse childhood experiences. Um, and we're grappling with the consequences societally of that in the need for trauma, um, trauma informed care. Um, and we see glaring health disparities where sometimes our health interventions designed to lift all boats, to lift everyone up, serve only to, or serve in large part to, to widen the disparities between the haves and the haves not, and the have nots. And we see many conditions which are tangled with other areas, such as the, the uh, animal sphere, zoonoses, uh, domestic animals, wild animals, um, that lead to outbreaks of conditions as various as Ebola, HIV AIDS, MERS, SARS, and now COVID-19 coming out of animal reservoirs and sweeping across an increasingly globalized world. Um, problems like this are legion. Um, we, um, when we're working in health and healthcare, the really gnarly problems, the ones that are tricky, the ones that call for um, all hands on deck or really uh, careful management tend to be complex problems. Um, emergency department waits, which may seem like a, a familiar issue to all of us, but a modest issue, is actually a, a reflection of a system wide, it's a symptom of a system wide set of imbalances. Um, backups in the ER that keep us waiting when we present for care are reflections of systemic imbalances between acute care and what goes on and availability of services in the community. Sometimes the problem is not so much we don't have enough resources, but they are divided up in ways that are totally imbalanced and lead us to go around societally in circles. And so it is with ED weights, where we have you know, a key need for services on the community side but instead the resourcing goes into the acute side um, and leads to, to giant wait times, uh, long waiting lists, um, uh, high numbers of patients who are occupying hospital beds and can't be discharged in time and therefore block people from entering the emergency room. Um, the opioid epidemic um, and polydrug use epidemics here in Western Canada are yet another example. Uh, predominantly these are managed in a siloed fashion but health, law enforcement, social services, and to some degree, even education are all tied up in this um, and are tangled together in ways that uh, defy a management purely from a policing side or purely from a prescription management side or purely from an, um, from an emergency department side. Um, uh, there's a whole host of issues that make this too um, a, a gnarly and, and truly complex issue. And the final one I'll mention is antimicrobial resistance. Uh, antimicrobial resistance that partly is coming from a farm sector where animals are delivered prophylactically, metaphylactically, and in terms of treatment, um, large amounts of antibiotics that then select for, that is they, um, uh, they select for antibiotic resistance. They suppress things that are not antibiotic resistant. The only thing, the only bacteria which multiply are those that are antibiotic resistant. But it's the nature of complex systems that what happens at one point in the system typically is promiscuous, it's pervasive. It affects things across the entire system. And 
the antibiotic resistance that starts on a farm can make its way into a long-term care home where your grandmother is staying, into our hospitals or dental facilities, and lead to potentially deadly infections using um, of, of bugs like Clostridium difficile or MRSA, methicillin resistance Staphylococcus aureus, um, or VRE, and, and other bugs that circulate. Um, so once again, we have siloed management. What's going on in the animal health side is, is typically managed separately from the human side, but they're linked at the hip. And um, there's uh, feedbacks uh, that operate on all sides that really cry out for a need for, for joint management. Um, we're dealing here often like blind men with an elephant um, in that ancient Buddhist parable where you had uh, blind men um, you know, arguing about the true nature of the elephant, each holding up a uh, part of the elephant for demonstration, one the ear, one the trunk, and one the tail, and arguing that the nature of the elephant is, is reflected by what they're holding up, such as this gentleman um, with the tail. And in fact, if we want to stop our crops from being trampled, or we want to stop um, you know, our farms uh, from being robbed by the elephants, we have to deal with the elephant as a whole and recognize that the systems we're dealing with are more than jumbles of pieces. Um, they, are, they, are, they are broader collections. All of these examples share one feature. They, they are what's called dynamically complex. This is not merely a, a term meaning complicated. I mean that they have are a situation where the whole is different than the sum of the parts. Just like a traffic jam, you can't reduce to individual cars. By studying individual cars, their engine types, their axle types, their, the tires they're using, you're not going to understand a traffic jam and, and how to avoid traffic jams. So it is with these sort of systems. We can't understand them by taking them apart only into their pieces. We have to recognize there's something more than the pieces. The pieces are important to be sure. We need to understand them. But we need to understand the interconnection between the pieces and how they all interact in complex ways to give rise to behavior at a whole, which is very different from what we'd expect from those pieces. And that's the mark of dynamic complexity of a complex system in a technical sense. Now, complex systems um, present um, a set of characteristic challenges. And you see these in a big way in health. Um, even interpreting what's going on in the world is the evidence from, that we're getting in from the epidemiological report supporting my hypothesis that there's large numbers of asymptomatic people out there. Uh, where is the system likely to go next? Um, with the province scaling back testing and wastewater indicators from last week giving record high values, um, you know, are we seeing dropping cases? Or are we seeing rising cases here in Saskatchewan? Um, is it a case where it's rising in rural areas and dropping in, in cities? Where is it likely to go in the next week? Um, um, what, what's driving these patterns? Is it uh, behavior emboldened by Premier Mo's rash, you know, um, uh, rescinding of, of many uh, safeguards? Or uh, is what we're seeing um, a reflection of, uh, uh, of predominantly undercounting of certain types of, of people, um, uh, people that, that wouldn't otherwise be reported or being caught through wastewater? Um, and is, is what we're seeing a, a good or bad indication? With complex, with um, infectious diseases, these patterns are particularly rich. And for many uh, centuries, they perplexed observers, such as these cycles we see with measles or pertussis or chickenpox, shown here for Saskatchewan and sh shown here for England and Wales. Um, we see it in patterns of disparity for chlamydia, for example, within, um, within Winnipeg. Uh, this from my uh, colleague, Ann Jolly, um, then at the University of Winnipeg, uh, then with uh, PHAC and now with Queens. All of these challenges makes it very difficult to interpret what's, to have a theory about what's going on in the world. We have some empirical data and we're trying to understand to what degree is, is our understanding of what's going on, our theory that you know, there's actually falling number of infections out there within Saskatchewan or falling numbers in 
urban areas, but rural, we're still seeing large numbers. To try to line that up with, um, uh, with the empirical observations um, generated by observed data, um, it's not clear what our theory would imply. What should we expect to see? If we're reasoning informally in our heads, that's not clear. You know, what's the population of rural areas and, and uh, what's the, the, the rate by which it spreads, considering that mask use is less common there and vaccine mandates are rarely enforced. Uh, compared to urban areas, which are more highly vaccinated as well. Trying to piece it all together in our head is devilishly complex. And studies have shown that even the most sophisticated math and science uh, graduates who, who, who know the most sophisticated math um, involved are, are terribly, um, face terrible difficulties. And it's completely infeasible to reason these sort of things through in their head. The problems are compounded when we try to intervene. We try to dictate, you know, to find the best places to intervene. Well, we'll have the greatest bang for the buck or the greatest, greatest gain, um, or the gain the soonest. Um, uh, when we want to know how should we intervene in detail or how do we scale up? And we're trying to make decisions between choices. Do we invest in more uh, testing sites or do we put our efforts instead into distributing more widespread antigen tests, rapid antigen tests. Um, we have to make choices. And, and this compounds our difficulty. Not only are we trying to understand what's going on in the world and make sure that our understanding jobs with evidence in the world, but we're trying to imagine how interventions, alternative policies, different public health orders, for example, might affect this situation or if we issue public service advisories, um, how they, they might um, affect this situation. And again, when we rely on informal reasoning, this is devilishly hard. And the challenges of this are writ large here in the province and across the world over the past you know, century, um, where when we fail to think of these systems in a consistent way, when we operate by the seat of our pants and uh, by guesswork and informal reasoning, it often really challenges our ability to learn from examples, from, to learn uh, for rural areas of Saskatchewan from what's going on in Saskatoon, um, to coordinate across different areas of the health system, the healthcare interface versus the public health interface, for example, prevention and treatment and screening in between. Um, planning and designing uh, and deciding and finally designing systems is, is really complicated. And often we end up working against the nature of things. And like King Canute, we try to order back the tide, push back against what's in the nature of things. And it tends not to work so well. As with King Canute, the tide's gonna come in regardless of what we say when we're working against the nature of things in the world. And once again, we see many, you know, dozens of examples of these sort of um, examples historically, where we have um, uh, had an oversimplified, um, inconsistently thought through approach, and uh, it's gone awry. Um, so to address these needs, uh, within the past 25 or so years, and I've been fortunate to be um, uh, one of the bigger proponents through this sphere, um, there's been real attention paid, an increasing number of, uh, of commentators, uh, prominent commentators, previous heads of the American Epidemiological Association like George Kaplan, um, Sandro Galea, good colleagues of mine um, who are social epidemiologists, um, or, or uh, the US NIH, pushing a vision of, of system science. And system science is the science of the whole. It seeks to grapple with these systems that are dynamically complex, where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And a key tool in the toolbox here is what are called uh, dynamic models or simulation models, computational models. Um, these models can be viewed as uh, dynamic hypotheses concerning what we're going on in the world, but they are, unlike hypotheses in our heads, they're operationalizable, they're, they're actionable, they're precise enough, not always to say accurate, but they're precise enough to, 
to say what will be the consequence. If this were true, what is the consequence? And that precision allows us to spot their flaws more quickly because we can run them, we can see if they're consistent, what they expect is consistent with the evidence and we can refine them more quickly and thereby refine our thinking. The idea here is that um, these systems posit uh, some sort of causal structure, some sort of mechanisms in the world to use the language of, of Pawson and Tilly and critical realist uh, thought. Um, uh, simulation models here uh, characterize a system in the world. Some of them do so with stocks and flows. I had sort of shown a, a model of this sort, um, you know, which I used my undergrad teaching course uh, in which we build up together where we have susceptibles exposed infectious recovered and hospitalized people. Um, this is another example which we've used for our daily reporting across the country for two federal agencies, all provinces, and, and for our day-to-day -day reporting to our health system here, which uh, shows uh, a number of people in the population are susceptible, exposed. Those are people in a latent state of infection, pre-symptomatic infection, and then stages of symptomatic infection or asymptomatic. And there's a distinction made for the U subscript versus the D subscript for whether people are undiagnosed or diagnosed. Um, and behind this is a set of mathematics characterized by what are called ordinary differential equations. Um, um, other models depict the population, such as we run for the province for examining the effects of interventions or long-term planning. Other models are used to um, depict the population at a, an individual level. We have a person in the model, so to speak, for every person in Saskatchewan. It doesn't know the exact characteristics of every person in Saskatchewan, but it captures the flavor of it in terms of the, um, the age profile, um, uh, someone's location, ge geography, um, and, and characteristics such as chronic diseases. Um, and each person will carry some aspects of heterogeneity um, in this uh, visual depiction, maybe ethnicity and sex and income, for example. And uh, over time, those people will evolve, um, um, evolve along one or more characteristics. Here, you could see evolution along vaccination status or a disease status with COVID-19, some asymptomatic persistently, some go on after a pre-symptomatic phase that is asymptomatic to a symptomatic phase, which can be either mild or severe or critical, which would land someone else in the ICU. We can also characterize their vaccine status, whether or not they're seeking care, whether they're in isolation or in community cohort facilities, et cetera, and uh, their status with respect to care seeking. Um, a model like this, uh, such as we have in the province, has diverse other factors, including them governing risk behavior, like mask use, participation in gatherings, probability of working from home, et cetera. And uh, in a model like this, we can place people in geographic context, um, in the large or in the small within a facility, we can represent individual long-term care facilities, acute care facilities like hospitals, um, uh, and, and represent uh, people's workplaces in ways that, that can help us reason what will be the impact of workplace closure or working from home um, or testing regimes in workplaces. Models like this allow individuals to be placed in networks uh, say family networks or needle sharing networks or colleague networks or social networks. And we can look at spatial as well as temporal emergence, behavior over time and be over, uh, over space. This from chronic wasting disease with contamination with prions being denoted in red. Um, we can, in some cases, we represent service delivery in health. For example, the flow of people in a hospital or in a clinic um, or flow of tests within the provincial testing regime, for example, um, to capture the effects of delays or to understand the effects of resourcing different areas of the system in terms of backups within the system, traffic jams as it were. So simulation models like this are a key tool and the most prominent tool of system science, um, the science of the whole. 
Um, and they have many uses. Um, perhaps the most prominent use, um, two uses in the pandemic has been, number one, to anticipate where things are going. And number two, to ask, what if we change something? What if we were to institute a mask, a widespread mask mandate in schools, as well as all indoor spaces? What if we were to up our level of vaccination? What if we were to uh, allow people in younger age groups to get their booster vaccines? What if we could put in place faster contact tracing uh, mechanisms? Um, these are what if scenarios, and we can use these models to simulate these what if scenarios. Um, and we can use them to understand why we might be seeing certain trends. Um, for example, why we might be seeing a sudden influx of cases in the older group or more hospitalizations at younger ages. Um, we can use these models to uh, understand what sort of data the model is most sensitive to, so to prioritize data collection, and uh, to more broadly help us um, evaluate the, the benefits if we were to restructure the system. Um, these sorts of models can uh, serve as potent communication tools for communicating with communities. And indeed, in some of the work with our modeling for the health authority, we were very successful partnering with MHOs on the ground, medical health officers on the ground, to motivate community action around things like mask use um, in our northern communities, to bring it up to levels that were unprecedented um, through through showing them scenarios of what could be achieved with good mask use using modeling um, by saying these are different health futures. If the community could come together around mask use at this level, it could lead to a game changer in terms of the risk that families would have to be divided by people being flown to Saskatoon for acute care. These models though, at a most, more basic level, they help us make explicit our assumptions about the world for discussion and collective refinement. And they can help us learn more quickly from evidence. Um, so uh, models are not, are sometimes held up as, as uh, you know, in somehow tension with data. And far from, that's far from the truth. Models help data go further. Models help us use data to more directly inform decision making because they help us link it into an overall framework whereby we can ask what if questions, if we could do this, if we could do that. And every piece of data can help support that. Um, every piece of data that's integrated with the model helps support that high level use. It helps data um, achieve a, a higher level of, of impact, in fact. Um, and models help us moreover use that data to more quickly refine our thinking um, because they help us spot when that data is at variance with what the logical implications of our thinking would otherwise suggest. Um, uh, and, and working with dynamic models, you're typically working with and leveraging the sort of tools you're learning in other classes, whether it's the tools of, of, of infectious disease uh, modeling um, that you're learning from Dr. Alphonsus, or whether it's um, uh, the tools from Biostats and Epi, these work together with dynamic models to help them go further. Um, now, I'd like to use introduce another analogy here, which uh, I think is a very useful one. I'd like to analogize models uh, to, in two different ways. One of them is the idea of that models are like maps. Um, uh, models represent simplifications of the world, just like a map does. Um, and it's the very fact that the model omits some details of the world that makes it feasible to use. It doesn't have to characterize, you know, the every single characteristic of every person in the province as if that were possible. You know, the hair color of, of different people and their their sartorial habits, um, far from it. It's, it's the ability to omit details, to zero in on you know, the key details, to boil it down to 
a small number of, of things, comparatively speaking. That's what allows these models um, to secure greater impact. Um, uh, it's, it's the omitting of details. But here's, here's where the analogy gets really useful, I think. Models like maps are abstractions of the world. But like maps, it's the purpose of the model that, that determines what details we keep and which we omit. So um, with, with maps, if we want to uh, drive from where we're located to the airport, um, we'd use one sort of map. If we wanted to take a bus from where we're located to the airport, we'd use a different sort of map. It doesn't have to have all the details of street intersections. It can zero in on the bus routes. Um, if you wanted to bike from here to the airport, you'd use a different map, map yet, one that really brought out safe bikeable areas, et cetera, um, and could, could, could help you navigate safely there. If you want to find out why there were flooding in certain areas, was flooding in certain areas of Saskatoon, or why there were electrical brownouts, you'd use other maps yet. Like maps, models are specific to purpose. How we're going to use a given model dictates what gets left in and what gets left out. And you could say that all maps are wrong, um, but that's not a very useful way to, to think about it because they're not being judged against, they're not trying to be a perfect reflection of the world. The question is, are they fit for purpose, for the purpose for which they're, they're meant? And, it, and it's a similar question with models. Um, George Box, the, the, the eminent statistician once said, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And really what he's referring to was, was very much in line with this. Um, uh, they can be used for certain purposes given the level of detail they, they uh, characterize. Um, and as we'll see, they're tools for learning to help us that are constantly evolving our thinking and the model. So why do I model? Why am I embarked on this multi-decadal uh, effort uh, involving modeling? Why have I devoted much of my professional life to it? Why do people come from around the world, from Australia, from, from Asia, from, uh, from Europe, and from around North America, or from, and from South America, to learn about modeling here at the U of S? Well, there's several reasons. Um, one is, to learn more effectively about the world. Um, and one component of this is ma by making my assumptions shared and explicit in a way that they can be critiqued by others and we can collectively refine them. So we can take our assumptions about the world, even if we're not translating them into a runnable model and we can put them down in a fashion on paper or, or you know, an electronic document that captures some of our thinking say the relationship between substance abuse and poverty and this is which is called a causal loop diagram. And those interested could go look up Peter Hovman's work, H-O-V-M-A-N-D on community-based system dynamics to see how far diagrams like this can go for um, gathering um, and helping to focus community action, gathering community energy and understanding and capturing a diagram. And uh, models help us make our assumptions more explicit so that others can help us refine them. Um, this is a quantitative model capable of being simulated, but we build models like this all the time with stakeholders. Um, and we build them visually so they can critique them. They could say, you're missing something here. You need to add asymptomatics or you need to capture you know, the fact that there's uh, there's individuals who have COVID for much longer periods of time than others. Um, you need to add a transition which allows someone to go from the, from the recovered state back to the susceptible state to reflect waning of immunity. Um, uh, when we put our assumptions out in a visual form, people can critique them. And that's an asset because it's not a failure of the model, but a success of learning, a success of modeling. Um, that we welcome these, uh, these critiques. Um, so for example, with opioids, we might represent the trans theoretical model, stages of change, um, uh, assumptions about how people struggling with opioid addiction engage with the care system or with the correction system, whether they're using um, 
where they're currently uh, using drugs from the street or from, um, uh, from, from prescription uh, or whether they're a former user, et cetera. Um, this from Chronic Wasting Disease with Cheryl Waldner. Many of these cases, we build these diagrams up with system stakeholders. Um, in some cases, these are eminent experts from, from a system here in Australia for our diabetes and pregnancy modeling, um, which is well described now in the literature. Um, uh, and these are, uh, this is now the chief health officer of Australia, uh, Paul Kelly, um, uh, currently um, uh, at the very top levels of uh, decision-making in Australia and various others here are experts in diabetes and diabetes and pregnancy, et cetera. Um, uh, in other cases, we have people with lived experience, people without high school education who come to our modeling sessions to tell us about the situation on the ground and help us build better models. A second need though here that models help with um, in terms of learning is, is to aid with making model of making our assumptions uh, more, more precise and testable. Um, okay, I, I thought I heard a sound. I thought that might have been a chat message, but it's not, it looks like. So what we were just talking about is we're finding the structure of the model. Uh, we make our assumptions explicit by putting them down in a fashion that the structure is clear and people can critique it. That's something models help us do. If those assumptions were in our head, we couldn't do that. We, the, people can't see our assumptions, and so it's harder for them to critique them. It's really when we put them in the clear light of day that we invite critique. We invite the learning that comes with critique. But another reason I model um, is because models of this sort are precise. And again, I don't mean accurate necessarily. They could be or they could not be, but they're precise enough that they can be simulated. In other words, I can see what the logical consequences are of my assumptions. Given this, I could say, well, okay, if this is the case, if, if it's really this way, go tell me, go figure, go tell me what the consequences would that, that, of that would be in terms of the number of overdoses I should see in terms of the number of people using uh, prescription opioids or, or who are kicked out by the prescription monitoring program. I could see something about the levels of families torn apart by opioid abuse. I could see something about the number of individuals who are abusing prescription opioids, et cetera. Um, the idea here is that models like this, they're not a crystal ball. We're, we're not using them to say this will happen, end of story, and the model is a success or the crystal ball is worthless and it, it should be crushed. Far from it. Models are more like a prosthesis. And you may say like, what the heck? What do you mean a prosthesis? Like an artificial leg? What does that have to do with a model? It has everything to do with the model. What we're doing, what, what we're addressing with the model though, what a prosthesis addresses, is a limitation. It helps us function at nearly a, a, a full functionality despite our physical limitations. The physical, physical limitation of this gentleman is, is he's missing a leg and the prosthesis helps him walk despite missing a leg, um, helps him engage in sports despite missing a leg. Um, that's the job of a prosthesis, whether it's a crutch, a cane, an artificial leg, it helps us function at our full level despite our inherent limitations. What models help us deal with is our thinking limitations. They're a thinking prosthesis. Our wetware up here, for even the most quantitative of us, uh, and, and studies have borne this out at, at my alma mater of MIT, where they've taken you know, math PhDs and, and uh, PhDs in engineering, who understand differential equations inside out are familiar with dealing with complex systems mathematically. And, and they ask them to make decisions about these systems and they're horrendous. They're, they, they make horrible decisions. They, they, they don't have intuition for it. Our wetware is not simulate, it's not set up to have us think consistently about these systems. So simulation models uh, by contrast can 
allow us to say, what are the consequences of these complex systems? Computers are really good at doing a lot of dumb things quickly in a row. And um, it turns out that if you give a model of this sort of sort, um, by, signal, by running a lot of dumb things quickly, you can see what the logical consequences are of that. You can play it out over time. It's like a micro world and you can kind of see what the consequences are. And, and this is really valuable because it helps us look at those consequences and say, to what degree do they jibe with? To what degree do they align with? To what degree are they consistent with what we see in the world? It allows us to think through the consequences of these sort of models in a fashion that is consistent that's guaranteed to be consistent to how we've characterized it. And we can therefore discover cases where it just doesn't add up. It doesn't add up to what we see from the world. And that can allow us to spot problems in, our, in the model and therefore our thinking uh, as captured in the model. It allows us to say, oh, it must not be this way. It must be there's something else going on. You know, maybe the rates of um, asymptomatics is it, the risk of being asymptomatic is different for men and women. Um, or maybe, um, maybe some individuals are just not being reported. Would that be consistent with what we're seeing if we posit that? And we can run the model with that assumption and see if that job is better with the data. So models here are tools for helping us. They're thinking processes. They help us reason consistently despite our cognitive, our physical limitations. Um, and they help us think more consistently, reliably, and rigorously about the world, and more quickly through what our assumptions mean, more thoroughly. And this allows us to put whatever empirical evidence we have to better, to better end. Um, it allows us to take that evidence and use it to, to judge the model. We judge the model against a crucible of evidence to test it. And if it's found wanting, we refine it. It's not the model is a crystal ball and it's good or it's useless. It's no, it allows us to more quickly say, oh, we must be off base in this. Let's refine our thinking. Let's go back and figure out what must be off here. Um, let's collect more data and see what must be off. Um, and this helps advance our understanding um, a lot quicker. So, you know, we started with these challenges of, okay, if you're trying to reason about the world and you see some empirical observations, you see rising cases, you say, are those rising cases a sign of an outbreak? You know, we're seeing a, a big outbreak in, in terms of the spread of infection. Um, should we be alarmed? Or are those rising cases a reflection of better case finding? We're just finding people more successfully. If I could abuse a much abused term, we're draining the swamp. You know, we're, we're finding people who are out there and bring them in and finding them for, and getting them isolated. And this is an advance. More cases can be good or bad, which is it? It's hard to reason about this in our head if we're just thinking informally, uh, whether it adds up with whether what we see from the world adds up to a picture where we're finding, merely finding cases more effectively. But if we use a model, that's what the job of the model is to say, if you posit this about how things in the world work, you depict it in something like this, this is how you think you know, um, by and large, people abusing opioids function, or this is how chronic wasting disease spreads. Um, then uh, we can we could say, okay, go figure and test if it matches up the empirical observation. And a good model should match up observation after observation after observation um, from different sorts. It should account for all that evidence. It should account for all that collected understanding. Um, so models here are tools. They're tools for learning more effectively, for refining the model over time by judging where it doesn't match up, but more critically refining our thinking about the world. And it's part of a general process when done well. And I have to credit Dr. Jenny Basran um, for her co-leadership with myself and Kurt Kruger uh, most recently. Um, for this, you know, it's, it, she can help drive as head of digital health, you know, collection of data from the world that will cross check the model assumptions, that will challenge it and help refine it. Um, uh, we can take a look at the effects of interventions to compare what the model thought would happen versus what we actually thought would happen. 
And we're always learning with these models. They're a way of capturing our understanding of a situation. Um, and the idea is, look, it's better to be transiently wrong. Try something, put forward an understanding and test it against the world. Take some stance and uh, working hypothesis, test it and, um, and evaluate it um, than it is to just sit back and say, I have no idea. In short, it's better to be transiently wrong than perpetually confused. Um, you know, try something, we'll, we'll, we'll posit something in our model um, that, and we'll fail forward. If it's not consistent with the world, um, we'll refine it. If it is consistent with the world, we'll pat ourselves in the back, but, but uh, go on to try to explain other things. Um, and you know, often a poor, even a poor model advances understanding by allowing us to spot inconsistencies in our thinking, in our assumptions. And Francis Bacon, the famous philosopher, uh, uh, you know, once once commented in the 1600s, "Truth sooner comes out of error than from confusion." The modern variant of this is "fail early, fail often, or fail forward." Um, Try something, make a working hypothesis, test it, learn if it's off base, and, and thereby learn and evolve your thinking. So those are some reasons I model, but I reason for other I model for other reasons too. Model because we all make decisions based on, on models. Um, that's gonna sound uh, you know, uh, like bold, if not absurd statement that we're all modelers, all of you are modelers. Um, the problem is most of those models are inchoate, they're hidden, they are our mental models. And they tend to be very poor at reasoning through the consequences over assumptions. Um, we're all making decisions based on models. The question is, are we going to make them based on models that are rigorously built based on a scientific evidence and that are consistently reasoned about or are we going to do it based on guesswork and sort of uh, inchoate reasoning in our heads um, in, in ways that can't be critiqued by others as directly? These sorts of models are put in front of our stakeholders with our meetings with Ministry of Health and health authority personnel. We would put down our model assumptions explicitly and we would welcome their critique and get them to challenge them and refine our models. Um, it is exhilarating um, and it is no room for ego in that room. It's, it's look, we're all trying to get a better understanding of the situation. Let's put all our heads together and, and refine our understanding. And let's capture it in a model that puts it all together and links it up with choices. Um, another reason I model is to you know, better understand what's going on. When we see patterns in the world, uh, when we see these patterns in cases, in reflection of test numbers and you know, hospitalizations and deaths and ICU numbers, et cetera, um, what's it telling us? Um, now, recently, and we've been a leader in this worldwide, um, and from the earliest months of the pandemic, we provided the support first for our province and then for every province in Canada. It's combining these models with machine learning um, to help these models learn automatically from data to be kept automatically regrounded with the latest evidence. Um, and to rely not just on, on just what the model expects was gonna happen here, but what the latest evidence suggests and the model state the model's depiction of the current situation is kept current with the latest data and evidence. Um, but um, it captures the regularities of say COVID-19 that we know from the scientific literature. It interprets it in light of what we know about COVID-19 and how it spreads and its natural history of infection, the stages it goes through. A stage where you're latently infected, you're not you're not yet infectious, but you're infected. A state of pre-symptomatic infection where you're terribly infectious because you have actually have your highest, highest viral load levels, uh, but you may not, you won't show symptoms. Oh, and then maybe stages of symptomatic infection and, and the fact that, that um, severe and even in critical uh, symptoms occur later, maybe six days after the start of normal symptoms 
uh, with original wild type COVID uh, SARS-CoV-2. And then, you know, there's an asymptomatic pathway that's particularly common in the young. Models can put these all together. And the models kept current with that understanding with these observations for the world. I like to think of it as kind of a CAT scan. A CAT scan works, um, unlike an X-ray, which took an image from one direction. A CAT scan works not because any one image is the best. It's because the collection of images collectively um, tell you a whole lot more than any one image. The whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And they can give a depiction on um, different types of data can be put together through machine learning and dynamic modeling into a picture of what's going on. How many people are out there and different likely to be out there at different stages in infection? Um, how many are asymptomatic versus symptomatic? How many are we catching and how many are we not catching? Um, now, once we've built a model, once we've secured conviction in it, we can use it to estimate intervention effects. And I'm very careful about this. You know, I, I tell the health authority, this is not ready yet. Say at, at certain times, they'll ask me, is this ready to use for decision making? I'll say, no, it's not ready yet. Um, we're still tuning it up um, and it's not showing the level of, of uh, match that we need to develop conviction in it. We have certain quality standards. Um, so here we're seeking um, uh, to, to address this, this crying need. When we were informally reasoning about a model, um, uh, you know, reasoning about the world, wh what might be going on in the world and matching it to empirical data was hard enough. But trying to reason about what would the effects of interventions on top of that was, was beyond the pale. I mean, it's, it's really, really hard to do informally. But if we have a model that can reason about this, often we can do far, far better. Um, we take interventions into account in the model and we could say, well, what if we did this? What if we did that? What if we expanded the speed of contact tracing or, or the, the number of, of testers available for that? What if we expanded the number of mass testing sites? What if we were to offer a fourth dose to uh, those uh, immunocompromised individuals and individuals over 90 years old in long-term care, um, et cetera? And, we can ask these what if questions and the model will consistently tell us if this model is characterizing our best understanding of the situation, this is what the consequences will be. And of course, we're refining that best understanding constantly. Um, now, models aren't for everything. As I said, like a map, a model is fit for certain, a given model is fit for a given use. Um, Different maps are needed for different purposes. Different models are needed for different purposes. Um, and generally speaking, there's greater levels of challenge that are needed um, with these models um, for, for successive questions on this slide. Um, you know, uh, with even a very rough model, we might get an understanding which intervention is likely to secure the fastest effect, soonest. Which one are we likely to see the effect soonest? Or which one will yield the largest effect? That's uh, not that difficult to start to get understanding on with a rough model. Um, will this change yield net gain or loss? That's actually more, more tricky. It involves being very numerically particular. Is intervention A likely to yield much better or just slightly better gains than intervention B? Um, uh, this, uh, this, can require some, some real care. Given an intervention, what's the shape of the resulting trajectory? Um, uh, successive ones, down to the last one, giving intervention, what values are most likely on a day-to-day -day basis going forward? That's really, really hard. And a lot of the reasons it's hard is because human behavior is so variable. Um, early on in the pandemic, um, I showed this slide. I think our Minister of Health was there. Um, Chief, Chief Health Officer, Sakib Shahab, uh, uh, Deputy, MA, Deputy uh, Ministers of Health, I believe, or ADMs, um, Associate Deputy Ministers. And, you know, I was, I was talking about broad interventions then. Um, um, for example, the principle that, look, the sooner you intervene, um, uh, actually, the more time you buy <laughs> um, till the peak occurs. If you intervene later, 
not only if you lost time in intervening, but the outbreak peak, peak will, will actually come sooner in calendar time. Um, and, and this was a principle, or you know, if you could close the borders um, internationally, uh, for example, you know, you can buy a bit of time, um, but, um, but you're not going to make the impact when there is an outbreak smaller. Um, these were very rough, you know, things on a very rough model, but I could say them with great confidence uh, because the model was fit for that use. Um, uh, you know, if we wanted to look at very detailed gains, this was from, I think, May 2020, maybe 2021, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, maybe April 2020. Um, but we were looking at, you know, quantitative impact of school closure to September, no long-term visitors, 90% workplace closure, community cohorting facilities for, for people to, sh to uh, isolate away from their homes, um, widely available PPE, so masks, for example, at hospitals and cohort facilities and long-term care. You know, what could we expect from a baseline scenario where we did nothing versus a scenario where we intervened um, with all of these measures in place? Um, and you can see that there was some chance of a, of a bigger outbreak in the fall, but we could really bring down the likely size of that outbreak. Um, I also model to anticipate what's coming. And frankly, this is much more effective with machine learning or with a model that's constantly recalibrated. We can kind of understand um, what, is, what is coming up here over time. The final thing I'll say, and I notice uh, Krisha has uh, her, her hand up here. Um, Krisha, did you want to uh, say anything or, or, or make a point? I'm in my final couple of slides here. Oh, no, I had a question about um, yeah. like uh, about like the infectious disease modeling. So did you ever do it for the uh, for school infections to see if how we can reduce the rates? Like, I'm just curious. I've never seen that in the news. Yeah, um, we did some we've done school based uh, looking at at school based uh, infections at a at a high level. For COVID-19, we've also yeah. done it for um, for pertussis uh, and maybe for chickenpox as well. Um, mm -hmm. What we didn't do, though, um, and actually our university wanted to, to to pay one of my students to build a model of the university, but all my students were so burnt out by that point from the <laughs> pandemic service to the province. We yeah. were working past midnight every night. Just oh, about, my goodness. Like six months straight, just yeah. constantly. Um, coming out with things, and uh, we we couldn't get them to do it. But what we didn't do, and what really needs to be done, is to actually have a model that simulates kids in classes um, yeah. and interactions between classes. There is some basic work of that sort, and I could I could find you some references, but it's not nearly as sophisticated as as we'd like. And we know how to do it. We have models of that sort for other types of venues like uh, nightclubs or like restaurants or like right. theaters or like stadiums, mm. um, but we don't have it for schools. And right. a model like this will be extremely useful and be very valuable to a lot of school districts yeah, uh, yeah. You know, for planning. So it's very, it's an excellent idea. But one of the things that the COVID-19 pandemic really brought out was a huge imbalance between need for modeling and the number of people who can do it here in Canada. Right, There's not yeah. Too many of us um, here, we and we know each other, and we constantly share things and so on. But right. but we need more people trained in this who can genuinely, authentically speak the language of health sciences and the language of the, the technical side of modeling. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what my lab is devoted to. Um, right. But, but we, we need more. And that's a great example of one of the higher priority projects that I just thought, oh, man, someone's got to do this. <laughs> I will tell you one other story, though, with it. So yeah. we were asked by our Ministry of Health and, in fact, by those in the North, could you folks mon model school-based spread? But we were asked one week before the policy had to be announced. Oh my gosh. We said like, we could do this with, with two months, maybe one month in a rush. Like if we put everything into it, 
yeah. with a student. We might be able to do it in a month, but there's no way we can do it in a week. Yeah, yeah, a lot totally. of recommendations for, to be agreed to by next week. Like there's just no way. No way, right. And so I said, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, it's just too late. And we were meanwhile monitoring outbreaks in indigenous communities and, and um, you know, colonies in the South. And right. there's only so much you can do with the resources that are available. And it's an unrealistic ask. That's so, true. Yeah. To see that done. Um, yeah, so, um, you know, the, the final thing I'll say here is, what, why else do I model? So thank you for the question, um, Dr. Alfonso. So why else do we model? It's, it's the least bad of the alternatives. Um, you know, Winston Churchill once said about democracy, democracy is the worst of all forms of government out there, except for everything else. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's terrible, but we don't know of a better one. And, and so it is with modeling. Modeling has all sorts of limitations. It has all sorts of, of problems with it. There are many but we don't know a better way to make reliable decisions. And it's a matter of being humble, always not viewing the problems with the model as a failure or something to be hidden, but it's something to be celebrated as an opportunity for learning. It's, an op it's a need for humbleness and humility coupled with you know, rigorous attention to the science to advance um, our, our understanding. And it's about using models in the right way. You know, without models, we, we risk working like King Canute at cross purposes with the nature of things. So this has been a whirlwind tour. There's, there's so much that uh, I wish I could communicate and I can't. And I'm sure what I have communicated, um, it's, it's, it's gone at such a pace that you may be feeling drowning in, in information. So I'd like to offer you a few key take home messages if I could. A mess, uh, addressing many challenges in the communicable disease area um, and beyond are hard because they ex exhibit features of complex systems. Even in, in, in infectious disease modeling, you know, we, we traditionally in health sciences, we, we, we draw firm decision, uh, distinctions between the people working communicable and infectious diseases and chronic diseases. The world doesn't have those neat boundaries. One of the things we've learned in, in spades, you know, uh, what we've observed in spades during COVID-19 is the two are quite coupled, right? People at diabetes are at higher risk of adverse outcomes for, for, um, for, for COVID-19. But more recent evidence suggests COVID-19 actually greatly increases the risk of, of or sizably increases the risk of diabetes. Um, it can bring out diabetes that wasn't previously there or works in diabetes that was there. Um, you know, it interacts with other chronic diseases um, and chronic disease and gender vulnerabilities to communicable disease. Complex systems are promiscuous. There's all these tangling that goes on. And um, that would be merely an academic curiosity were it not for the fact that most of the world's biggest problems are complex problems. They are wicked or they are, um, they are merely technically complex, um, some distinction between those. And, uh, and problems that are technically complex um, uh, need to be addressed by tools fit for that complexity. Uh, well, in traditional epi, we gain great insights by teasing out associations, um, say by doing a, a regression and, and teasing out how much of the variation in the outcome can be attributed to variation in different particular covariates. Um, we need with uh, complex systems to go beyond that to understand, it's not that that's not useful, it's super useful, but we need to complement it with methods that can deal with non-linearity, that can deal with bi-directional uh, causality, uh, that can deal with the fact that there are many systems where we can't just parcel things out into mutually exclusive pieces. Um, it's a tangled combination of them. And dynamic modeling provides us tools for representing and reasoning about the behavior of complex systems. Um, models express dynamic hypotheses that, about processes that underlie observed behavior from the world. And they help us understand what's going on in the world and how intervention is likely to affect things. Models are specific 
to purpose. Uh, they're specific to certain types of goals. And multiple modeling types, I, I only gave reference to kind of those stock and flow, those box and, and, and arrow models, which I showed, which are called stock and flow or system dynamics models, and, um, and models that are individual level. Um, and in general, there's three major traditions of this modeling, and they're all complementary for, for making decisions about uh, these systems in health and healthcare. Models have strong limitations, but maybe the, the least bad of the alternatives out there for making decisions about these sort of systems. And infectious diseases, communicable diseases, we've known about the needs for these sort of models for nearly a century now. The work of, of Ross on malaria in 1916, the work of Kendrick, uh, um, McCormick and Kendrick in 1927, laying out the so-called S susceptible I infective uh, R recovered model. Um, um, these have laid the groundwork um, for a uh, groundswell of modeling in this area over the past century that reflects the fact that it's, we're dealing with nonlinear systems here. The sum is different than, the, where, where the whole is different than the sum of the parts. And um, uh, in infectious diseases, um, we need more sophisticated reasoning um, than has uh, long been recognized as, as being needed in, in say chronic disease management. Things move quickly and they move in ways that are surprising and non-obvious and pervasive. Um, you know, inequities anywhere in the system can endanger us all. Um, you know, the occurrence of infection in the downtown core um, of uh, chlamydia or gonorrhea can lead to risk of someone in the suburbs getting it. Um, it's, um, it's pervasive, it's promiscuous, it spreads uh, widely. And an infectious disease epi was one of the first areas where we realized um, we had these features of complex systems. Um, feedbacks, nonlinearities, delays, disproportionate impact of heterogeneity, et cetera. And where this sort of modeling has long been enshrined. So um, for this class, just remember, there's a large canon of, of modeling um, that can inform decision-making, but models are not crystal balls. They're fit for purpose. And um, what model we built depends on the, the needs uh, for it, whether it's for forecasting, what if questions, uh, or, or for explanation, for theory building, et cetera. Okay, those are all the, the comments I've uh, prepared here. Um, I'm glad to answer questions um, from this group um, as time allows, or to otherwise direct it in a way you'd like. I mean, I could show you a running model if you wanna see that. Um, I, I, I am teaching my modeling class right after this, and I've got models up. Um, but I could also uh, just dialogue with people, um, uh, whatever, whatever you'd like. If you wanna hear war stories uh, from the front lines of modeling provincially, I'm glad to do that. Uh, however you'd like to use the remaining time. Thank you. I Thank you. Question. Oh, go ahead. Yes. So I was wondering, so in your like day-to-day -day work, do you use SAS and SPSS? We use um, packages like them, and, I, and certainly I've used SAS and SPSS quite a bit. Um, our, our most common package for our base, uh, analysis is an R for statistics. Uh, so we use the statistical package R, which is widely used in biostats as well. Um, but yeah, my, my students, uh, some of them know SAS um, and we've gotten licenses for SPSS before uh, a student of mine was just using it this semester for some analysis. And those are very useful tools in our toolbox, yeah. Hopefully that's, those are helpful comments. Those aren't the tools we use for dynamic modeling. Those are statistical tools and biostatistical tools of great value, but we have separate tools for dynamic modeling. Question. I see uh, Guru Prasad. Yes, Doctor. Doctor Oscar. Uh, thanks for the wonderful presentation, and it really gives a basic idea about the modeling. Uh, I follow you on LinkedIn, and I would like to take this opportunity uh, to express. You know, uh, uh, I, I work as an uh, assistant epidemiologist at NITA in Prince Albert, so I've seen your 
uh, modeling about Omicron yeah. uh, quite before its peak in Saskatchewan. And after that, I realized that your model has predicted uh, uh, to its best and it has reflected in the real time as well. Thank you so much. It's, it's my honor. Um, there is no greater purpose for our modeling of Guru Prasad than, um, than to serve uh, those uh, communities uh, of greatest vulnerability. Um, and that includes work with uh, Northern communities. One of the foremost honors of my career, indeed my life, um, was working with MHOs, um, including those through NITA, um, to help protect uh, Northern communities uh, early on, such as Lalash, um, Buffalo Narrows. Um, uh, and uh, uh, that, that modeling um, was conducted uh, together with not just uh, the deputy MHOs, uh, people like Dr. Kaketla, Dr. Rim Zaid, um, uh, Dr. Namdi Nandabuka, and, and, and others, but, um, but also uh, with community members. Um, modeling is a living um, process. It's sometimes treated as a um, technical process carried on by mathematicians, you know, on blackboards in distant academia. In my view, it is uh, a living and breathing process best undertaken with community members, those being affected by the models. Um, this is a matter of philosophy, but it's a, it's a philosophical position that is securing through, in, in significant part because of my efforts, um, efforts uh, to, to elevate the importance of the human factors that's spreading around Canada as a priority for modeling. And I must say, our NITA partners have been among, amongst our most uh, valued partners. So your work, um, I'm sure I've benefited from it uh, indirectly. And as I told Dr. Alphonsus coming in here, um, people think of modeling as something done by geeks like me, you know, in the back office, um, in the dark in a closet sometimes. And no, it takes, it takes a village to build a good model. It takes a great team to build a good model. Everyone here could be a modeling team member and contribute you know, in important ways to the success of a modeling project. And so our, our, our modeling, to the degree it's been successful, it's because it's built on the shoulders of giants. Giants at NITA, giants at SHA, um, very helpful parties at the Ministry of Health, uh, party said Public Health Agency of Canada, FINIB, um, in, uh, Indigenous Services Canada. Uh, you know, it, it's because we can work with them. And if I have secured some benefit for people by translating some of my insights into comments, it's here. I did feel I had to speak up about Omicron at a time where again and again and again, I heard it misperceived as mild and, you know, it's no threat and, um, you know, there's no dangers uh, of, of really severe outcomes to hospitals. And I, I had to say, you know, this is at least as bad as Delta and look where we're at. We've exceeded the Delta levels of hospitalization. Uh, we have kids in ICU at levels that were unprecedented. And um, unfortunately, a lot of those actions, uh, you know, a lot of those concerns have been born, born out. I, I will say one other thing with modeling provincially. Um, you know, um, much, much has been noted about how the provincial government failed to act on our early, repeated, and urgent um, uh, um, comments on the modeling front. Um, uh, and, and that's true. Uh, we, we presented the scenario for the Delta wave in June. Um, we anticipated what would likely play out, and it played out extremely um, close to what we anticipated to, to very bad effect and I've had colleagues die of non-COVID conditions because I couldn't get an ICU bed during the peak time of COVID. Um, this, this was a terrible scourge for our province and led to dozens of people being flown out of the province, needlessly, some of them dying far away from family in Ontario. Um, and uh, if I pause there, it's because of emotion. Um, in, in, in the case of Omicron as well, um, there was a failure to act on the models. But I want to say this, um, unless people think the models were entirely shunted aside, I need to cite my colleagues at the SHA, 
um, under the leadership of Dr. Basram, but also colleagues like John Crow and others, who, who recognizing the, the real danger of ministerial in, um, inaction um, at the SHA level, they put into place emergency planning efforts to, to help them, our system withstand the, um, the coming crises um, more effectively. They use the modeling to inform, for example, ICU training for nurses over the summer. So all the time where the ministry wasn't acting, the SHA was. It wasn't sitting uh, waiting for the ministry. It was acting to get together ICU teams. So if we only had to fly dozens of patients out to Ontario, it was in large part because we had many, many more resources for our ICUs because of model recommendations. Um, it allowed them to plan ahead for what was likely coming. Um, and with, with Omicron, it's been similarly. Um, we have been able, the system has been able to withstand the shock that came with inaction in large part because the modeling helped it prepare. Um, and um, once again, that modeling is not foundationally just mine. It is the charter of all those in the province that contributed to it and yourself may be included from, from the data we've gotten from, from Nitha or what have you. So anyway, I, I just wanna emphasize this is teamwork and it is, it is work that informs um, uh, decision-making at many levels. Um, and it allows our system to be more robust. Uh, uh, thank you. I, I think um, celebration is, is due those at the front lines um, who work even now um, you know, tirelessly to try to address um, you know, the scourges of this, uh, this, this uh, outbreak. Yeah. So um, thank you. I'm enjoying this dialogue. Are there any other uh, comments or questions people would like to, uh, to bring forward? So I'm, I'm, uh, I note a, a position in the chat. Um, uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, my internet connection, so I'll have to review the presentation again. Even among my co-authors, there's a lot of COVID fatigue and a lot of people glaze over when it comes to modeling. I know modeling is important. People are fatigued. Um, I can't tell you how fatigued <laughs> part of my team is. This is absolutely the case. And once again, I mean, I could say a platitude, you know, we may be done with COVID, but COVID isn't done with us yet. And this is part of the, the challenge, right? Um, it's not us who dictates uh, entirely the schedule for things. It's, um, uh, it's, it's COVID there and people are fatigued, but what is the alternative? Um, um, if we don't have time to do, to make decisions, to, to, to do things right, why do we always have time to do them wrong? If we're not gonna make decisions based on modeling, what are we gonna make decisions based on? Um, and often we don't have a good alternative. Um, sometimes you may, I, I, I don't wanna say models, I'll just one tool in a toolbox here, but, um, uh, we can be tired of it, um, but at the end of the day, we have to soldier on to, uh, to serve. Um, and when I got sucked back into day-to-day -day modeling needs uh, at the end of November, because I saw you know, the reports on Omicron coming out of South Africa, and I followed it daily and worked a godly number of hours between then and now, it was because, uh, not because I wanted to, and not because I wasn't tired, I was terribly tired. I didn't like sacrificing my Christmas break to that, but um, because I knew the stakes were so high. Um, and I will say, my colleagues in the SHA, my colleagues in, in other organizations, uh, uh, such as uh, NETHA, Northern Intertribal Health Authority, um, in, in First Nations and Inuit Health of, of Indigenous Services Canada, et cetera, um, they have been working beyond the pale sometimes. Um, I, I, you cannot imagine um, the level of exhaustion that some people are going through, a great personal um, gain. So I'm sympathetic to the idea we're all tired and exhausted. Um, I'm sympathetic to that. Um, but, um, you know, uh, we, we, we can't let up at this light level. Maybe I'll just say, two words, uh, you know, a few words about, we're in the closing minutes here. Um, you know, what lies forward? Our modeling has informed us a lot about this. Modeling in general has informed us a lot. There are three competing hypotheses about what lies forward. I happen to put 
more emphasis on one of them. I think actually following Omicron, uh, we're, we're gonna have a, uh, a comparative lull for uh, six to nine months as uh, on account of the higher levels of population immunity gained uh, variously through vaccination, breakthrough cases against vaccination and, and through, uh, through infection. And, and there'll be time enough to rest there. And I'm looking forward to that already. I'm, I'm relaxing a little bit despite teaching two courses <laughs> managing our lab. Um, but I will say that, um, you know, there is the risk here that Omicron through infecting such a massive numbers of people um, will, um, will stir up another uh, variant. Um, it will infect, you know, someone who is immunocompromised will live for a long time, mutate and, and emerge kind of a COVID Zilla phenomenon. Um, uh, that is possible, and we are likely to see likely waves. But I think we're we are uh, we are transitioning mostly into an endemic regime. Um, I was just contributing to a conference last week, presenting to Dr. Tam and others on on the endemic regime, and um, uh, you know we are likely moving towards a situation where we're going to have seasonal um, COVID nineteen. Uh, way, you know, uh, outbreaks, just like we have seasonal flu. Um, and both will strain our system. Seasonal flu already imposes great strain on our system, and so will COVID-19. Um, so we're likely to deal with that. Um, there is also the possibility that we'll see alternation between different waves of, of uh, COVID-19 lineages. So I think we're, we're going forward to a brighter future. Um, I think that the age of big waves coming regularly is, is getting past and we will see the occasional ones, but I think we'll have plenty of time to relax. And I think we will. Um, and I can already feel it myself, uh, you know, following Omicron, I think, you know, we'll, we'll be in not, not bad shape for a while. Um, I could be wrong, we'll see. So thank you very much. It's my honor. I teach now my modeling class, uh, it's starting yeah now. So um, I'll go over to that. Um, <laughs> It's been an honor to uh, present to this class. I hope that was useful. I hope the recording offers benefit. And uh, I want to thank Dr. Alfonso for, uh, for the invitation and hope, hope that this has offered some benefit. Um, if you're interested in learning more, I have a couple thousand videos. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, Dr. Oscar, for that very interesting lecture. Um, I learned a lot. I always learn something every time you come in and do the guest lectures for this class. Um, and thank you also for doing all the modeling for COVID-19 in Saskatchewan and helping the health region out. Um, it's always great to have you. Um, so I don't want to keep you waiting for the other class. It's 2.31. So thank you. And um, I guess once I hit leave, it should get recorded to the cloud. I'm pretty sure that's how it works. Great. Yeah. Great. And maybe you could send me the link when 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 it's. Available. Yes, definitely. I'll send you the recording. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. you. All right. Bye. There's a lot of a lot of circulating bug out there still. I know the internal numbers. Be, be careful. Okay. But our numbers are still very high. Be really careful for the next few weeks. Okay. Yeah. All right. Take care there. Thanks. Bye. So long.